Hello and welcome to OETC 2022 and Maker-Centered Learning in Every Classroom. I am Paul Shercliffe. I have been an educator for 25 years, mostly teaching physics and mathematics. You can find me on Twitter at Shirky17. My website and my email are my name. In case you didn't get the slides from the OETC 22 website, they can be found at bit.ly slash OETC 22 maker. That is bit dot ly forward slash OETC is in caps 22 and maker is lowercase. I put my script in the speaker notes as well as some links that I utilize. I will describe maker centered learning a little bit. Like all things that are wide and vast, it is a little difficult to define, and the more we try to define it, the more we restrict it, and the less we understand it. Then I will give some classroom examples, as well as school-wide examples. I will finish up by sharing a few of the multitude of resources. Maker-centered learning is not a new concept. It is a mashup of those great pedagogies and ideas that we were taught about years ago by Dewey, Montessori, Papert, Piaget, and Vygotsky. It is not one more thing to add to your plate. It is a way to learn. I believe the best way that we learn. At the core is designing, building, or creating of an artifact. We make stuff, we prototype sometimes more than one prototype. Then there are conversations that you can have from it or around it. Those conversations can be different for each learner and the teacher weaves the necessary content into these conversations. The artifact can be the conduit through which all the learning happens or a demonstration of the learning. Conversations. The learning and assessment are in the conversations the ones that you have with the student or small group of students, as well as those that the students have with each other. These conversations can be while they are building, as well as after they are done creating. Again, the conversations can be, and even should be, different for each learner while still weaving in the content. The emphasis is process over product. Making an artifact is important, but not necessarily the be-all, end-all. You can have the conversations without finishing the artifact, so the learning can still happen. Obviously, we want the students to learn how to be successful and to feel successful, but sometimes we don't have enough time for everyone to finish making something in class. That is one of the difficult parts of maker-centered learning, helping every individual to be as successful as possible within our constraints. Making opens up and utilizes multiple parts of the brain at once and bridges them to work together. It is naturally transcurricular, blending various disciplines, often so you don't know where one stops and the other one starts. Everyone knows something you don't know. Give them the opportunity to share what they know. We were making cube puzzle pieces some students were coloring with markers, some were painting with acrylics or fingernail polish. One student wanted to hydro dip, and I didn't know anything about it. So they told me what, what it was and what they needed. I just had to say okay. They found what they needed in the room. People always ask, why do you have so much stuff in your room? My reply is, I never know what a student might need. They had her dip their pieces, then they showed others how to do it. Some people call this distributed teaching and learning. Everyone is a teacher and everyone is a learner. One of the great advantages of maker-centered learning is that there are so many modalities and ways of making. They can be digital or analog. They can be low cost or expensive, low tech or high tech. Drawing, painting, modeling, coding, robotics, poster design, video, podcast, gardening, woodworking, play, songs. Because there are so many, every learner should be able to find some that speak to them. 
Students might already be doing things that we wouldn't have thought of. Listen to them. Give them space to try things. You don't have to know how to do everything. You can't be expected to. You just have to be comfortable with exploring the unknown with others. A student was explaining their work to me one time, what they had done so far, what they had learned, and tell me what they needed to do next. When a nearby student overheard and said, I already did that, I can help. This from a student that normally keeps to themselves and struggles with getting steps accomplished. Maker-centered learning helps develop agency. Students learn to know what is next as well as what they know how to do. They also like sharing and helping others. Building confidence is important. Empowered is a good word. Maker Start Learning is very much learner-centered and offers many opportunities for voice and choice. The conversations come from their perspective. What do they want to make or how do they want to make it? What materials do they want to use? There are often many paths to get to our learning goal. Sometimes we might have to limit the choices and give them a list of options for our own sanity. But we still need to listen to that one student who often has a different idea or path. Making allows students entry points to the learning from their point of view and or perspective. A conversation with the learner who will probably be an engineer starts differently than the one who will probably be an artist. But both conversations can evolve to discuss the content that is at hand. Studying Newton's laws through mousetrap cars, the engineer wants it to go the furthest. Function. The artist wants it to look good. Form. We can have both of those conversations. They can tweak their design to incorporate what they want, and we can still weave in ideas about Newton while all that is happening. When they start from their own perspective or viewpoint, conversations are much easier to have, and the learning is in the conversations. Maker-centered learning fosters the seas of education that people like to talk about. But for some reason, people always leave the most important one out. Curiosity. The others follow from it. Creativity, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, community. Yes, makers build communities as well as help their own community. There are many other C's you could come up with as the Twitter community did during a road trip by some educators. There are many benefits to creating a culture of creativity. Learning activities become multidisciplinary. Self-expression is prevalent. Thinking and problem solving are needed and happen. Stress and anxiety are reduced. Our minds end up in a happy fun zone. We feel a sense of purpose. We feel pride in accomplishments. We find others with similar passion. Our ability to focus increases. So does our risk taking. We come to learn that progress takes iteration. We start down a path to innovation. We understand that learning is a lifelong journey. Making it is good for us. It helps us find a sense of accomplishment. We remember things that we make, not tests that we take. Dan Ryder shared via Twitter an example of a student that couldn't stop sharing the chessboard they had made. Can you picture the student smiling as she shows off her work? Pride, accomplishment, success. I made something that I or someone else can use in the world. We are born makers. Mud pies, blanket forts, sticks for swords, tea time. It's how we understand the world. But for some reason, we stop. Then wonder why we don't understand the world. The world is really a STEM maker lab waiting for us to explore it. What kind of maker are you? Sewing, baking, metalwork, gardening? I've always been into electronic gadgets and technology. I really got into woodworking about five years ago and created a garage workshop. Let's take three minutes to think about and share in the chat what we make or what we would like to learn to make.
Now the question is, how could you incorporate that into a classroom learning experience? It's always best to work from a place of comfort, so starting with something you already know is great. Maker is a mindset, a way of approaching things. There is a willingness to try new things. I can fail and try again and eventually get something. I can take things apart and understand them. I can mash things up and make something viable. I can manipulate things in the world to fit me or help my community. I can impact the world around me. Ideation, prototype, iteration, if I'm given time and space and support. John Spencer made a nice graphic about some of the offshoots of maker mindset. Empathy. We learn it and learn to begin with it. Explorers. We want to know how things work and how we can adjust and adapt them. Engaged. We have more focus and attention. Risk takers. We will try new things because failure is all right. It just means try something else. Divergent. We think differently and see that all people are different with various strengths and weaknesses. Connections. We connect different ideas as well as with different people. Problem solving. We can do almost anything because we know how to solve problems. Learners build competence and confidence with processes, materials, and tools. Being inventive and innovative also comes from our maker mindset. I think that Maker Mindset helps us to discover our passions and interests. What are we interested in? What are we good at? Currently, because those things can change as we grow. So we need to keep supplying learners with this kind of environment as they grow and change. Here are some ways that Maker Center Learning can show up in any classroom. Do you want to learn about measurement or scale and proportion? Make stuff. Even your own measuring devices. How better to understand what the lines on a ruler mean than having to put those lines on it in the right places? This can be done many ways from Google Draw to Tinkercad to Inkscape, and you get to personalize it. Print it out on paper, cut out in vinyl, 3D print, laser cut. What does it mean for an object to be 50% or 150% bigger? Design models, make models, get your hands on them, See them from all angles and sides. If you're studying shapes and geometry, make them in various sizes out of various materials. Discuss the properties students encounter. Discuss the material choices. We partnered up and built geodesic domes out of straws and pipe cleaners. We split the class in half and also built them out of PVC pipe. There is some cutting involved with both materials so they also get to learn about different tools and safety. With the big PVC models, we also added market it as something, a tool shed, a greenhouse, create flyers and a commercial. Students assigned themselves roles they were interested in and did some crossover during the project. Graphic designers did some buildings, some builders helped with graphic design. They did all that on their own. Want to talk about Newton's laws of motion? Build hovercrafts or mousetrap cars. Ask lots of questions. Listen to the questions they come up with. Why did you run into the wall? Always came up. So did, how can we go faster, further? Can we do? Also comes up a great deal of the time. Have a conversation about safety, then how to do that. If you need to explore buoyancy, make things that float. These can be foil or cardboard. Does cardboard float? Or even 3D print. It is often best to start with low-cost, quick prototypes, then move on to better materials. In learning biomes, students need to represent and explain important aspects of their biome. One student liked to paint, several liked sketching. All had to explain what and why for the things they put in their work. This is a great opportunity for choice. Some students wanted to make models of their biome. Others made websites. That works also. Again, great opportunities for student voice and choice. Here are the constraints for our goal. How do you want to accomplish that? 
We also got to have fun with the cricket. Students cut a vinyl sticker of their favorite animal from their biome. Find an image in the proper format. Get it to the cricket computer. Get it into the software. Adjust it. Load the material. Press go. Peel, aka weed the vinyl. Many skills involved all while we talked about the animal and the habitat. They took the sticker home or put it on the computer phone. These are the negatives or outlines of the stickers they made that we put up on the wall for everyone to see what we were doing. Monsters. Who doesn't like monsters? Or mythological creatures? In biology, we study reproduction and genetic traits. A great way f is for learners to design a set of parents with certain traits, then breed them. Now the students need to create the offspring to learn about and demonstrate dominant and recessive traits. Sometimes kids want there to be three parents. Go with it. Voice and choice. These can be drawn in color. They can be designed in Tinkercad. You can 3D print or not. We could do some sewing and make plushies. How about plushies to donate to a children's hospital or homeless shelter? In various science classes, we study earthquakes. An important part is how earthquakes affect buildings. Obviously, we need to do some building construction with various materials and shake them. Start with simple and expensive materials. Have discussions. Change materials. Spaghetti works. So do straws or coffee stirrers as well as toothpicks and popsicle sticks. What else would you use? The shake table is one inch PVC with eye screws in it and a board to place the building on. The board's attached to the PVC with rubber bands and sits on top of some marbles that are in a plastic lid. Students put their building on the board and move the PVC side to side. How many board games exist? How many board games about historical times? What board game could students make to demonstrate their understanding of an event, time, place, person? Design your board, design your pieces, rules of play. Ask questions, listen to conversations. Paper, cardboard, 3D print, laser cut, whatever tools or materials you have. What other topics can be turned into a board game or a computer game for that matter? There's an episode of Chairs from the 80s where they use Monopoly to teach Woody about economics with a whole mishmash of pieces because the originals got lost. That works great. Mash things up. Do you need to study the Roman times? Do it while building catapults and have lots of discussions about the rise and decline of the empire. Wars, science and engineering of the time, projectile motion, precision, accuracy, have a different war to discuss, build the machines of that war, and let the conversations flow. Use the materials and tools you have. We did trebuchets for a couple years in physics as an at-home project with very mixed results. Then we moved to doing it in class where everyone used 2 by 4s and accomplished better learning. Though having a dozen trebuchets does take up a decent amount of space in the classroom. What did we learn from reading the book? There are so many things that kids could make in order to open up that conversation and so much imagery they can utilize. A student of Kim Stanley made a lampshade with key things from the book Just Mercy. Candle boxes are an easy thing to make with images on each side. Students share and discuss why they chose images or what those images meant to the story. Students could make props from a story and discuss their importance. Having that physical artifact makes the conversations flow easier. How many ways can you think of literally making poetry? Not just writing poems on a piece of paper and turning them in. David Theralt has students take a walk and capture pictures of words. Then they do some cropping and arranging to make short poems. I could also see students creating poems then working with a friend, or just themselves, to take a picture that would be the background of the poem on a poster. Not just do a Google search, unless you need to go that way, but collaborate with a photographer. Creators, not consumers. And yes, I think all schools should have poster printers 
that are constantly used by students to put their work up in the hallways. Dan Ryder and his class read of Mice and Men. He wanted to get beyond project-based learning and into problem-based learning. He was thinking about reading a book in service of solving a problem instead of creating a project to prove you read the book. So they asked the question, what do the men in this story need? The short answer was they needed a place to call their own that was affordable. Thus was born of mice and tiny houses. Students would design and build models of tiny houses based on the needs of the men with evidence from the book. They would have to consider budget, research migrant workers in the 1930s, and interview current tiny house builders. Dan and his students feel that the skills and thinking from this project will last a long time, not just till the next test. He also thinks schools can be problem-solving incubators driven by empathy. What things could you discuss with gardening is the focus? Native plants? Climate and weather? Food's role in a culture? Farming versus industrial society. Nutrition. Diets around the world. Spices. Measurement. Food deserts. I think every school needs both indoor and outdoor gardens, if not a greenhouse also. What community service can you do as an offshoot? John Ume Kubo and his students create some awesome layered 3D designs. What kind of 3D scenery layers could students create in your subject area? What kind of discussion could students have while they create these? Scenes from a book? Scenes from history? What stories or poems could they write based off a scene that they create their own? This can be done with just paper, or you could use cardboard. You could even use a Cricut or Cameo. You could 3D print layers. If you have a laser cutter, as John does, you could use that. You can even add some LEDs to bring in circuits. What things could you discuss centered around snowflakes? There is the obvious science, compounds, freezing, crystals, and math, symmetry. How many books or stories or poems have snow as a theme? Any historical events? When you make them, just remember, snowflakes have six-fold symmetry. How many ways could you make snowflakes? Obviously, there's old-fashioned paper and scissors, but there's coating, 3D printing, woodworking. They can even be made from household products. I had a student design one with tableware and another with cosmetic containers. Remember, it is about the conversations you have. The learning and assessment is in the conversations that you have with the student that students have with each other. It is process over product. So think of what conversations you can have and what conversations the learners might have if we get out of their way. Maker is a culture, not something you write into a lesson plan once in a while, not a special day, not just a room in the building. Culture is what you do intentionally every day and it gets built by tiny actions all around us. For maker-centered learning, it can be about having splashes of and opportunities for curiosity and creativity all around the building and campus. One school took the old trophies out of one of their hallway cases and replaced them with the parts to build a computer. No real instructions, just an opportunity to put things together and make a working computer. When it got done and they saw that it worked, they took it apart for another set of kids to try. What other devices could you put in the hallway for students to assemble? Do you have a metal door? Do you have some magnet tiles? Put them up, see what designs people come up with. Be aware, some tiles might go missing. There are some very inexpensive ways to create a physical light bright. The Children's Museum of Cleveland uses pool noodles. Pool noodles are awesome maker materials. Colored golf tees and pegboard is another method. Put up a chalkboard in the hallway for doodling, poetry, or graffiti. You could try chalkboard paint on some other surface. If you prefer, you could use a whiteboard. 
Yes, we have to monitor what goes up on the board, but that is nothing new. The hallway near the Western Reserve Academy Makerspace has a light bright kind of device. It is actually made from light up dials that change color based on how you turn them. What kind of interactive walls could you create? Legos? Marble Run? Put up a challenge table. Mark Karcher has tried an origami challenge once in a while. He puts out paper and a QR code for instructions. He has found the students get bored if it is always origami. You could try some building with straws. Straw uses a brand of connectors. There are others. You can include pieces of pipe cleaners for connectors. You don't need a whole pipe cleaner to connect straws, so cut them into pieces a couple of inches long. If you leave the whole pipe cleaner, they will use whole pipe cleaners. But for some reason, when you leave whole straws, they cut straws as needed. Paint a wall green or hang up a Dollar Tree green tablecloth. See what photos they come up with. Maybe give them a theme. Have a contest for free dessert at lunch. Remember to utilize outdoor spaces. Potting tables to play with natural elements, sculptures, games, a stage to play act on. Be sure to show off student creations as many ways as possible. Get the hallways filled with student work. Rotate it often. Utilize social media. Send pictures home. It has been said for a few years, don't just turn it in, publish it. Get a student committee to create and self-publish a yearbook of creations. All of the signage around the school can and should be creative and made by the students. Replace or cover up all the room number signs with new student designs. Let students personalize them for each teacher. Change them out once in a while. Give new kids opportunities. Make the place scream. Around here, we are creative. Which of those school-wide ideas resonates with you? Which culture building things would do you already do or would you like to do? Which can you try next week, next month? Let's take two minutes to share in the chat. Got some ideas? Ready to put them into action? Mm -hmm. 
there are a myriad of maker resources, sometimes too many. So I'll share a few of what I have. We made a list of 100 books for your library, for your classroom, for your makerspace. The bit.ly link is makerspace books, bit.ly forward slash, capital M, A-K-E-R, capital S, P-A-C-E, capital B, O-O-K-S, the M, the S, and the B are the only ones capitalized. Obviously, I've not read all of these. They are categorized as being for students or for teachers or projects. I know there are many other books out there. If I'm missing some that really need to be included, please let me know. Examples of books for students include the Ada Lace and Rosie Revere and Friends series. Oops is a good one for them to read about making mistakes because we all know making is rife with oopses. The Most Magnificent Thing and The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind are other books for students to read. You can do story time and read parts to them yourself. Kids of almost all ages like being read to. You can have picture books and elementary books in a high school. They activate the brain differently and get things started. Obviously there are tons of books out there full of maker projects. Which ones are the best? Depends on your audience and your goals and your topics. The teacher books are intended for us to learn more about maker-centered learning. These two are often considered to be the top of the pile. Invent to Learn by Sylvia Libo Martinez and Gary Steger, as well as Maker-Centered Learning from the Agency by Design Initiative at Harvard's Project Zero. Since Dale Doherty kind of started the whole maker community thing with Make Magazine, you really should read his book, Free to Make. Lifelong Kindergarten by Mitchell Resnick from the MIT Media Lab is a great read about what education can and should be and is very maker-centric. Educators often talk about the C's of education, but rarely the P's. People working on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. If you need some quicker reads about maker-centered learning and makerspaces, grab Worlds of Making by Laura Fleming and The Maker Mentality by Nicholas Provenzano. Laura is an educator in New Jersey and Nick is an educator in Michigan. I have not mentioned tools and materials very much in this presentation, though a little. That is because there's an infinite number of materials. Anything can be a material, even dirt. Use what you can easily get. There's also a wide variety of tools at a wide variety of prices. No two schools have the same stuff. No school can have everything. What do the kids want? What will they use? What will your community support? Those are important questions. My Twitter PLN has created some lists for people to peruse, to trigger some ideas. They're shared in the speaker notes. The bit.ly for the larger spreadsheet is bit.ly slash A number two Z materials. B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash capital A, the number two capital Z materials in lowercase. But it's a big list because anything can be a material. Every space needs to have examples of how to connect paper and cardboard for construction purposes. 
since so much prototyping can be done with those simple, relatively inexpensive materials. Just Google paper connection techniques or cardboard connection techniques. You'll come up with a lot of pictures like this. You are probably asking, how do I do any of this? As the Chinese proverb says, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And as Chris Kringle says, then put one foot in front of the other. Start with one topic, one maker-centered learning experience. Learn from it. It will probably feel like it failed. But anything new is hard and different, so it needs to be judged, evaluated differently. Ask the kids. Did it go well? What would we do different? Maybe give them the reins and see where they take things. These kids will literally make the future. While I have you, let's mention storage. You need stuff to create with. You will have projects in progress. Where do you store the materials? Where do you store the projects? Everybody's answer is different, but get a plan. You need shelves, even carts. Portable is good. Get a variety of totes and boxes. Have things visible and labeled well. They can't use what they don't know they have. As the saying goes, out of sight is out of mind. There are some good hashtags to follow or search when you're looking for ideas. Hashtag MakerEd, hashtag Makerspace, hashtag Makerspaces, hashtag STEM. STEM and Maker have a great deal of overlap. I have created a Google form if you have any favorite resources or ideas to share or feedback to give, bit.ly slash OETC22 maker feedback. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash O-E-T-C is caps, the number 22, maker feedback lowercase. I will put them out on Twitter. Is your favorite resource a uh, person, place, or thing? Those would work. Have you done a maker project that you would like to share? Do you have an idea for a maker learning experience that needs some tweaking? Did I help you? I hope so. There can be a lot to maker, but it boils down to this. Make something and have conversations around it. Don't be afraid to let those conversations diverge you end up learning a great amount about your students. Learn through making. In reality, you are probably already doing some kind of maker learning. The key twist is the making process and discussions at the focus, not just the project at the end. You don't need a big maker space with lots of tools, but that does give students more options. Every room should have some stuff for making in them. And that stuff changes as our ideas evolve. Remember, the most important maker space to develop is the space between the ears. I hope you do want to incorporate some uh, MCL into your lessons. There might be some things that it doesn't work for yet but I believe it is the best way for us to learn. Besides being a great way to explore content, students gain so many other skills that are necessary to thrive in the world. No one knows everything. That is why so many teachers are on Twitter. We don't just share what we are doing. We ask for help. Often. Reach out. Network somehow. Though I can't help with money. We can give you ideas about budget, but everyone's solution is unique. Thank you for spending time with me. I always love to talk maker ideas. If you'd like to talk more about maker education, contact me on Twitter at Shirky17, 
that's S-H-I-R-K-Y, and the number 17, or email paul at paulshercliffe.org. I will stay in the chat for conversations for a while. Have a great conference. Make something today.